that you are thrilled tonight to have a great man of God who's not only led worship in this house numerous times, uh, he is, you know, I don't think Lyndall Cooley needs an introduction. We can go back to Brownsville. We can talk about his amazing church that he pastors in Nashville. I mean, we can just go on and on to the songs he's written and the things that, the ways that God has used him. But he will tell you more about this story. But I know that many of you in the last few months have been on your knees as we were at our house crying out to God for him because he was at death's door. And this is something that just came in uh, unknowingly to him and his family. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we wouldn't be introducing our speaker tonight. But God came through, and God came through as he always does. I want you to welcome properly Lyndall Cooley as he comes to bring the word tonight. You may be seated. Thank you. Hello, everybody. You know, uh, Dr. Brian, could we get another stool? Is it possible one more of these? Is there another one somewhere? Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's holy because it's got animal print. <laughs> the next Every one might not be as holy, but it will be here shortly. Well, it, it, <laughs> you can always spot a pastor's wife. She's got blonde hair and animal print. You know it's true. That's why you're laughing. How's everybody? We're going to have a slow start. We're going to wind up the pitch, and hopefully we'll hit a home run. If not, come back next week. It'll be better, okay? <laughs> Welcome. How many of you are from Cleveland area? How many are holding your hand up high? Awesome. How many of you are from outside the area? Wow. Thank you for coming. And all of you watching online, thank you for being here. So many people wanting to know, oh, look, it's got animal print too, you see? <laughs> Dual anointings. Um, I want to first acknowledge the house. I want to acknowledge my dear friend, Brother Perry Stone, and his lovely wife, Pam. I have known... <laughs> and, of course, Dr. Felshaw. I'm not Felshaw. Cutshaw, I have a Felshaw friend too. Cutshaw and Faith, we love you so much. And uh, Perry, uh, when I first heard Perry Stone preach, I, I was just a, probably just barely out of diapers. And uh, <laughs> no, I really, really wouldn't. No. Uh, Perry was preaching the Bessemer Church of God camp meeting, and he was very young, and I don't know if him and, he and Pam were married yet. I don't think they were, and I was unfortunately not there for spiritual reasons. <laughs> I was with the rest of the hoodlums outside cruising for a date after church. Look, when you're a church kid, you got to go where the girls are, and hopefully they speak in tongues if they're at a Church of God camp meeting. <laughs> so you kind of look for them, and the girls walk, and the boys walk, and you try to find a date. I remember there was a young man who will go unnoted, unnamed that invited me to come with him to that camp meeting, and uh, I'll never forget as long as I live. Perry had preached wonderfully. I didn't hear much of it, but it was wonderful. I could tell. And uh, <laughs> my friend had a couple of girls, and, and one of them was pretty. And I told him he could have the ugly one, and I would take the pretty one. And he did the weirdest thing. We were talking to these girls after church, and he said, let's all go grab something to eat. We'll drive you home. We'll drive you home. And... Uh, I said, by the way, where are y'all from? One of the girls said, Pelham. He went, Pelham? I'm not driving all the way to Pelham. And he just walked away, left me with the girls. I drove to Pelham. <laughs> I 
took two girls for a hamburger. Nothing came of that. Should have been in the service of receiving from the Lord. But I was a kid, okay? I want to uh, invite my wife to come. Amber, come up here, if you will, and grab your singing mic. And, and we're going to sing in a minute, but uh, I'm going to do what I want to do, if that's okay. Can I do what I want to do? Okay. I want to just kind of share, I guess I'm on the thank the Thanksgiving tour. I'm on the tour where I'm thanking all the people of God and all of you watching by internet, all of you who prayed for me. Uh, 16 weeks ago or so, something around there, I had what is called an aortic dissection, which I've never heard of. I didn't know there was such a thing. Amber says she knew about it. You sit there, you're prettier, you'll be better seen. Right there, okay. Uh, I had what was called an aortic dissection. And basically what it is, is your aorta that goes above your heart, up into this part of your body, and goes from your heart down. Uh, it just delaminates. It comes apart. And uh, there was no warning at all. There was no warning of any kind. I'd never had heart trouble. I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have any kind of hypertension. Don't have sugar diabetes. Don't have any of that stuff. Uh, what, never smoked. Not a drinker. I'm still one of those old holiness people who don't believe in it. Not many of those left. Anyway. And uh, so when, when this happened to me, uh, I had been out washing trucks on a Friday night. Matter of fact, it's a connection to the ramp. I had just gotten a call from Karen Wheaton, and she had told me that they were trying to buy the building across the street, and God had opened up the door for that. And uh, the Lord spoke to me that we should give an offering. Our church, our ministry should give an offering to that work. And uh, it was $50,000, and I had to get board approval to get to do that. So... My associate and I were talking about trying to figure out how to do this. I said, I really want to do this. Can't do it without their approval. Washed all the cars, went to eat dinner with my family. And uh, I honestly have to tell you, Saturday morning, September 17th, I don't remember anything. I don't remember getting out of bed. This is where, Amber, you have to help me. Grab your mic and help me. Tell them what happened and how it came about that morning, because I, I really don't know. Well, I was getting ready to go to something called um, Prayer on the Square in our town. Um, and I had gone into the bathroom to get dressed, and I heard him calling me. It sounded really strange. And the third time, I thought, I didn't know if he was snoring funny or, <laughs> you know. So I poked my head out the bathroom. I said, are you calling me? And he said, something's wrong. It just came out of nowhere. And he said he was having a really sharp, horrible pain in the top middle of his chest and that he couldn't breathe. So I called a doctor friend of ours and told him what was going on because I wanted to call the ambulance, but he said no. Um, Man of faith. <laughs> so he said, Are, does he have any other symptoms? And when I looked back at him, he had turned a really strange, weird, lifeless looking color and he was sweating. And when I told him that, he said, call the ambulance right now. So I did. And um, I ran upstairs because our son was home from the ramp. He was attending school there. And I ran upstairs to grab him because I just felt like I needed some help. And I said, stay with your dad. I'm going to get the ambulance here. And so it took the ambulance like 25 minutes to get to our house. I was like, surely there's more than one ambulance in this town. <laughs> you know, I'm telling the lady I'm getting kind of upset about it. And she said, well, they've dropped one patient off the hospital and they're on there. And I'm thinking, really, one ambulance? So um, Isaac stayed with his dad and was so good trying to keep him awake because he was kind of going in and out of, um, what's it called? Consciousness. Not consciousness, but uh, where you're awake, but you're kind of in a daze. Um, Not sure what to call that. Yeah, I don't... I, usually can remember, but I can't remember right now. Um, anyway, I could not think, I knew I needed prayer, and I couldn't think of one person to call. My, 
mind was just so, it was being traumatized, I guess. So I thought, oh, I'm going to call my parents, but they've, they're already with the Lord. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to call Lyndall's parents. And they're with the Lord. They're with the Lord. So the only person I could think of at the moment was to call my pastor, um, Kilpatrick. And so I called him. I think that's the first time I've ever on my phone called him. So when he entered the phone, he knew something was wrong. And I said, please pray. You've got to pray for Lyndall. Something's wrong. He's having chest pains. I've got the ambulance coming. I'm going to put the phone on speakerphone so you can speak to him, speak over him. And pray I don't remember him. any of this, none of this. Yeah. So non-responsive was the word I was trying to think of earlier. But anyway, so... Um, I mean, he wouldn't communicate with us, but he was, you know, awake. So he spoke over him and prayed over him. And then I called our associate pastor at church to let him know what was going on. And um, the amp Pastor Kilpatrick called me back and he said, I really feel like I need to start, I need to reach out to other pastors and churches and get this on a prayer chain going right now. We need an army praying. And I, I was like, please just, I'm thinking in my head, I hope this isn't a false alarm. And it was just a pinched muscle from washing all those vehicles. That you <laughs> but, um, it wasn't, it was pretty serious. And, um, I didn't give the paramedics my phone number. I just sent him with the ambulance. I told them to take him to a certain hospital. And they said, well, we have to get him to the nearest hospital so that's where i went to find him the local hospital yes close to our house the one in our town and they came out about 10 minutes later and said i don't know why they sent you here he's not here and i thought oh my god he's probably in a morgue by now you know i'm thinking you know as a christian we're supposed to be strong and have faith and you know pray and believe everything's going to be okay. But I'm going to be honest with you guys and tell you, I was struggling that morning. Just, I, I told pastor's church this about two, a week or two ago that, I mean, I couldn't even get like that little grain of mustard seed faith. It was so hard. So I just had to trust the Lord that the prayers were going out and God was hearing the prayers of the people because I felt like Lyndall didn't just need it, but I felt like you know, I needed it too because I felt like I wasn't even capable of praying what needed to be prayed. So the lady told me he wasn't at the hospital. And um, she said they actually medevaced him to Vanderbilt. So I get, Isaac and I get in the car and we take off to Vanderbilt. And I'm probably We're about halfway. a 45 minute drive to an hour's drive, about an hour's drive from Vanderbilt. Yeah. Where we are, where she was. So, um, driving, just, you know, believing let, and praying. Let me intersect here and tell you that my father passed and went to be with Jesus. Is it okay to just tell you the story? Are y'all okay with this? My, my father passed in June, uh, June 8th this year, uh, 2022. And I had met, as my dad was in his final days, I'd met a lady I had graduated high school with. Her name was Stephanie. Uh, now she's got a married name and I didn't know it. She and I exchanged, this is God. Let me tell you, I'm here to encourage you. I've got a word for you. I've got a word for you. And if you'll listen, I believe God's going to change some things in this room tonight. But I want you to hear this, how God does things. Nothing happens by accident. It's all father filtered. It's all father filtered. So literally, here's this girl I haven't seen since high school. And she's a nurse. And she says, I can get you any information on your dad you need to know because I know he's in a bad condition. Here, take my number. And I took her number and listen to this. That was in June. This is September. So <clears throat> Isaac and I are driving to Vanderbilt and I'm not paying attention to where I'm at. I'm just, you know, just really in freak out mode. And, um, what, and wondering if I'm ever going to see Lyndall alive again. I mean, it was, it was just terrible. And so um, I thought to grab Lyndall's phone as I was leaving the house because I thought, well, maybe he'll be okay and I'll give him his phone later on. 
And um, his phone rings, and I just felt like I needed to answer it. And this lady, she answered, or she said, is this Amber? I said, yes, it is. And she said, well, my name is Stephanie, and I grew up with Lynn in Alabama, and I'm the ER nurse at Williamson, yeah, Williamson Medical, and I'm working the ER today. And I don't know if anybody told you where he was, but he's right here, and I'm sitting with him. And... <laughs> She said, is anybody coming up here with him? I'm just going to sit here till they get here. And I literally looked up. Hallelujah. And the exit was right in front of me. And so I pulled up. Two minutes up. you were there. Yeah. And so I was so thankful. Um, but when I got in there, they had, him, had taken him back to the cath lab. And when they came back, they said, his heart is fine. His arteries and everything are wide open. He's not having a heart attack. He said, they said it's one of three things. It's either blood clots, embolism, or something like that. And they said, or an aortic dissection. And I'm thinking, oh, let it be something simple like blood clots, because I know that can be fixed, and that's not a major, major, you know, intrusive thing. And um, they came right back and said, it's the aorta. We have to get him to the hospital now, okay. to Vanderbilt, where they specialize in those surgeries. said, we have to get him there. Now he has to have surgery. And so here we go to the third hospital. And I really felt like he was being fumbled around like a football. They say that, you know, if you're not there in an hour when you're having this, you're a goner. So I get there, can't find a place to park. I'm in my big truck. Right, uh, trying she to drives a 3500 Dodge Dually <laughs> flatbed. <laughs> She's got it downtown. Okay. Nashville looking for a parking place. <laughs> well, I'm dying. In the parking garage, and I'm hitting the top of the thing, and I'm nerve-wracked here, and I'm just like, get me out of here. And I get out, and I just go sit in a parking lot. <laughs> just like, what am I doing? Listen to this. So then doc a man in our church named Dr. Maldonado. Who's a doctor at Vandy. Yes. Um, was helping us to he, because he was the first one at the hospital, the other hospital, when this was happening with Lyndall because he knows so many people and wanted to help. So anyway, he called me. He's like, where are you at? I'm in this parking lot. Tell me where. I'm just here. Well, he finds me, drops me off at the front door, and then my phone rings, and this lady said, Miss Cooley, where are you? Um, are you at the hospital? I said, yes, ma'am. I am at, I don't know where to go. I'm standing in front of the hospital. How do I get? She said, don't move. I'm going to come get you. She gets me. We take off running upstairs, and they start putting these papers in my face, and the doctor looks at me, and he says, um, your husband has to have surgery. If he doesn't, he's going to die. He said, we're going to try to save his life. He has a 30% chance of living. If we do not get this surgery done right now, he's going to die. And these are the things that could happen to him during surgery. You just need to know these things. And I'm thinking... Why don't you just hurry up? It's been long enough. Get him back there and save his life. You know, just go. And um, I, I'm telling you, I was trying to be strong. It was hard. I didn't know if I'd see him again. And um, Lyndall, <laughs> he looked at me, and he, his color had come back. They had put oxygen I on I don't him. remember this. No. None of it. And he was kind of being his funny Lyndall self. And uh, he said, where's my doctor? And so I, I said, doctor, he's calling for you. And he said, do you know Jesus? And he said, yes, I know Jesus. And, the, and you know, he, they talked a little bit about when he told him what he did. He's Lendl, being a pastor. He said, uh, trust me, you want me to do my job, but you don't want me to do yours. I would not be good. He, he's a very smart man. He has a really bad stutter. So I think he was trying to say that you really don't want me to preach because he had a stutter. But and he said, but I'm very good at what I do. So um, he looked at the doctor and he said, don't put me in the newspaper. <laughs> I don't know if that meant he didn't want to be in the obituary. <laughs> he didn't want to be on the news. <laughs> so anyway, that was the last thing, you know, he said before he wheeled out and he kind of spoke a blessing over the doctor, but it was And I intense. don't remember any of that. So that's why I wanted her to tell that part because I don't remember it. That happened on Saturday, the 17th. I had a seven-hour surgery, seven hours. 
On Sunday, there was a complication. They had to open me up again. That was a shorter surgery, but yet it was another, which brought my chances of survival down into the teens. They didn't think I was going to make it. I woke up in the Vanderbilt ICU on Monday night. I came to it Monday night, and Amber is there with me. She's holding my hand. I was telling Perry this before service. I had a breathing tube down my throat. I'm hooked up to all kinds of machines. I look like a, a science experiment. I mean, there's just tubes and everything everywhere. And you have to understand, the last thing I remember is going to bed Friday night. I don't remember getting up and hurting. I don't remember any of it. I, to this day, I have no memory of that. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and when I came to and that breathing tube was down my throat, I started to struggle. And I said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And my Amber squeezed my hand and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit right then said to me, calm down and endure this. You're going to live. And I felt the peace of the Lord come over me. I wish I could say that breathing tube was comfortable, <laughs> but I knew it was there for my good. It wasn't going to kill me if I quit fighting with it. And I just calmed down and I was at peace. It took them two days to try to tell me because I kept saying with Amber, I go, did I have a wreck? Is my truck okay? Yeah, what happened? Is my truck okay? Did I have a wreck? What happened to me? And they started trying to explain it. They were using big words, you know. And, and I never got it until the next day. Finally, the doctor from my church, Dr. Maldonado, is holding my left hand and my wife's holding my right hand. And he's telling me what really happened. And he's told me, he told me that you took six hours to get on the operating table. You should not be alive. You should not be alive because the, the, the odds go from 30% survival to below that every minute you're not on that table getting help. And he kept saying, you're a miracle. You're a miracle. Now, let me tell you another thing. I never experienced pain. Not one pain except for the one she was telling me about that I don't remember. <laughs> None. And they had me on pain meds in the beginning, and, and they weren't affecting me right. And I just made them take them away. I said, please, just get rid of the pain meds. you got to find something less than this. I, I can't function with this. And they put me on some of the lowest stuff. I mean, three days after my surgery, two days after my surgery, I'm down to these little bitty nothings of, of pain. I never had pain. I had discomfort with my rib cage because they cut my sternum open and they took my heart out and stopped it. Put my blood through the machines and put it back in and restarted it. I was uncomfortable because my rib cage was all messed up. But I never had pain. They sent me home. I was ready to go like in four days. I was like, let's just go on home. We're done with this. And they go, no, Mr. Cooley, you can't go home yet. You've got you've got to be have real rehabilitation. You're going to need at least a month of rehabilitation. Would you like to do it in residence or at home? And I said, what's in residence? He said, well, we've got a place here by Vanderbilt that you can check into and they'll rehabilitate you. It's, you know, physical rehabilitation. They'll do that for about a month and then you can go home. I said, well, if I need it, I guess I will. So in my brain, I'm just going, and, and I thought, my filter is gone. I, I've never had a good filter. <laughs> but what little I had went away. And this nurse who was a resident nurse, she was an older nurse practitioner. I got to talking to her one day and I said, and I was just bold. And she said, I said, you go to church? She said, yeah, I, I grew up Baptist. 
And then she started moving into this. But you know, I've learned with a lot of things. I said, what have you learned? She said, well, I've learned that you kind of need to live and let live. I said, what are you referring to? She said, you know, homosexuality, all that stuff. Just let live and let live. Let God be the judge. I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> she said, why? I said, you're talking about people headed toward eternity and they're going to fall off a cliff and you won't even tell them about Jesus. You're just saying live and let live. You have become socially and politically correct and Christian. as a Christian, you're ineffective. Now, I don't know what you need to do, but you need to get it right. I preached to my nurses. They'd come in with a Bible name and I said, are you living up to that name you've got right there? I mean, I'm just evangelist in the, laying in there. And I mean, it's like shooting minnows in a barrel. They keep coming in and I just keep getting them all. It was international ministry because there were people from every nation coming to poke me with a new needle. And I thought, if you're going to poke me, I'm going to poke you back. And I just started loving on people. It was wonderful. And I was ready to get out of there. I got out of the hospital in 13 days. They sent me home with 10 or 12, 11, well, maybe 13 meds, different meds. Within a week, I was off all the meds except two. And it's a low-dose aspirin. And half of a blood pressure med, I don't need it except they want my heart to not beat fast while it heals. They want to keep the pressure down. They sent me home a bottle of pain pills. As a pastor and a minister, I have counseled too many drug addicts in the church who started on pain meds. And I was determined to not use them any, unless I needed them. And so every night for seven nights, I took one pain med and I went to sleep. I took, it was supposed to be taking them every six hours. I never did it. I took one every, every evening. That's all I did. At seventh day, I said, Amber, I don't need these anymore. And I have to tell you, that is how my recovery has gone. Now, I'm going to get to my point here. You're going, Lyndall, are well, you just going to go on with all this foolishness? No, I'm going to go. I'm sitting down because I'm dealing with another physical thing that I, that I need to have worked on. But I've got to sit down. Is that okay? Okay, good. Honey, can you move over here closer and we'll put our chairs over here? Because I'm going to get to my notes. I've got a message for you. I've got a word for you today. While I was in the hospital, once I got off of the bad pain meds and I was myself, I was totally myself, I was off of all that, the Lord started talking to me. He started speaking to me about his church. What? Yeah, you have? Yes, I can. It's Holy Ghost trying to speak. I'm trying to listen. Um, they call her Sister Holy Ghost right there. We've been married 26 years. Let me tell you something. Never a better friend in the world right here. Better, never a better friend. Man, when you're in trouble, if you marry right, Nick, I hope you picked a good one. You don't know yet. We'll find out later. Y'all still in that lying portion where you lie about everything. Once you're married a few years, the lies start going away. and You're going, oh my God, he does snore. Right? I saw a lot of things. What do you want to share about that song? Oh, um, I put worship on the second they let me go into the room. I just thought I need the atmosphere to be. God needs to be in here. Oh, I'm not my, gonna my, my, my. <laughs> let any residual thing that was in that room or anything coming in that room is going to be met with some worship. So, um, of course, I asked if it was okay first, and I. I just left it playing. Our friend Tony let us borrow his little speaker tater. <laughs> and <laughs> it's nicknamed Tater. Yeah. So um, 
I finally got somehow got some worship playing, and I was afraid to change it because I finally got it working, and it, you had to hold your mouth just right. So when Lyndall finally started coming too, there was a lot of songs on that playlist, and I don't even know where the set list came from, but it just kept playing over and over and over. And I said, I know these aren't your favorite songs. Do you want me to change it? Because there was one particular song, person that you kind of got on his nerves before. Um, and I'm like, do you want me to change it? And he was like, no, it's wonderful. <laughs> I'm thinking they got you on something. <laughs> 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 or, <laughs> or either he's just really had a change of heart with this whole thing. But anyway, so that's all I was going to say. Well, one night, after about five or six days in the hospital, the Lord started speaking to me. I didn't ask him to. I want to impact you with this simple thing. God does nothing by accident. Everything is father filtered. Nothing that will ever happen to you is an accident. Do you hear me? Good, bad, ugly, none of it is an accident. And before the enemy, I can give you Bible proof, and Perry is here, and Dr. Cutshaw is here. We can get you straightened out real quick that the devil can do nothing in your life without asking permission. Now, you think about that for a minute. You think about that for a minute. Well, the devil just came in. No, he did not come in and do anything that he did not get permission. And before the father gave him permission, he already had the answer to your situation at the other end of it. Would you have preferred not to go through it? Yeah, you would have rather not go through it. But guess what? Father said you're going through it. I know that shoots some of your faith teaching in the head, but I'm going to just totally pound that beast until it's dead. I used to think it was my faith that would bring a great miracle. I used to thought, think that I needed to have this faith and I needed to build my faith. Amber said something about she didn't know what to pray. She felt like her faith was almost non-existent in the moment it needed to be. Well, guess what? Mine was completely shut down because I was unconscious and don't remember any of it. I couldn't agree in prayer. I couldn't ask for prayer. I didn't have anybody. I didn't know what was going on. Are you hearing me? God saved my life and brought me back from death. Are you hearing me? Without my faith. He did it by the faith of God's people. This, I'm gonna preach a minute. This is why you don't need to be a nomad and this is why you don't need to be sitting on your couch thumbing through stations looking for the right preacher, you need to come down and get to be a part of a local fellowship and get down and dirty where we know what you really are and you start loving on people and they love on you back because you never know what situation might be coming down the road that you're gonna need somebody to have faith for you that you cannot have for yourself. All of us think we know how to do this and we'll be, I couldn't help myself. I was in life or death situation. You prayed for me. And I came to tell you, thank you. That is a thank you I will never stop saying to the people of God all over the world. You saved my life because you called on the Father in Jesus' name. And God said, not today, devil. Not today. So excuse me if I don't believe your excuses that you've been making for why you're not healed. See, we've created a theology that supports our unbelief. Well, we're going to pray for God to do this, but just in case he don't. Who are you trying to save? Whose reputation are you trying to defend? Every miracle comes from God. I've never healed one person. It is always Jesus. It is always the Lamb of God slain before the foundation. It is him who does the work. He doesn't need your apologetics. 
Mm -hmm. So, I'm laying there and I start seeing and hearing the Lord. The first thing I heard from him, I heard multiple times, the same words over and over, multiple times, multiple times. He kept saying, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And I said, Lord, your church knows it. He said, no, tell them again. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And I thought, what? No, three times over days, he just said it over and over and over. And almost as if God was frustrated, if Jesus were frustrated and broken, he had a, a, a brokenness in his voice. And I said, Jesus, what are you saying to me? And he's saying, son, my church just doesn't love me the way they should. They have other lovers. They're in love with their phones. They're in love with their ministries. They're in love with their music. They're in love with their life. They're not in love with me the way they should. And I said, oh, Jesus, what can I do? And he said, don't worry. They don't love me the way they should but my bride will. And I said, what's going on here? He said, I'm turning my church into my bride, but all of them won't go there. I know that rocks your theology. It's okay, let it rock it. I was listening to this music Amber was playing for me. At one point, we had the scripture on one side playing and the worship playing on the other side. And it was wonderful because I'm in this hotel, um, this, not hotel room, this hospital room with really ugly stains on the ceiling. I'm thinking, man, Vanderbilt could afford it better than this. <laughs> I want to tell you this too. I never feared that I would die, not once. Not once did I fear death. As a matter of fact, I was listening to Lauren Daigle on my left side, and she was singing a song called Rescue, which I really hadn't listened to. I don't listen to Christian music much. I don't like it. It's just... Blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. My friend in France who pastors a church of 15,000 told me, he said, you know, he said, nobody does worship better than Americans. He said, but you've lost your heart. I said, well, why do you sing so many old songs? He said, if it doesn't bring the glory, we don't sing it. So he understood, blah, 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 blah. And I'd never listened much to this song. As that was playing in my ear, several days after my surgery, I'm not on meds anymore. I'm not hallucinating. I promise you I'm not. She said a line in that song that says, I will send out an army. When she said that, it's as if the whole roof of that hospital was removed. And in the spirit, I saw the angelic host, which incidentally is the army of the Lord. We've been singing, we're the army of the Lord, but I can't really find that in the Bible. We're ambassadors, representatives, children, sons and daughters. The army of the Lord is a heavenly host, right? She said, I'll send out an army and I saw him. I've never seen them in my life, but I saw them. <laughs> oh, did I see them? I could not stop seeing them. They were as far as my eye could, till so they disappeared in minutia. They were everywhere. It was, they were about, I don't know, I estimate nine to 12, 13 feet tall 
almost translucent, bright, had a fierce look on their face, a frightening look on their face. It would scare you to death, but I had no fear because I know their face was not set against me. And they had these swords drawn, ready for war, and they were standing over me. And I said, Lord, what am I seeing? And he said, this is the army I send when my children call out to me in distress. And I said, Lord, why would we ever fear anything? God is wondering why we're so afraid. Because the heavenly hosts are standing, swords drawn, ready to defend the name of Jesus in us. You see, it's not me that they're defending. It's the name that I'm wearing that they're defending. It's my Father's name that is written on my soul and my heart that the enemy sees, and that's what the angels will come to defend. When I worship Jesus, the heavenly Father stands on his throne and he says, Holy Spirit, angels of God, there's somebody who agrees with me right there. They're worshiping the darling of heaven, my son, Jesus Christ. Go affirm them. They're worshiping. See, you have no idea what's going on in the spirit. You have no idea because the enemy has lied to us. Just because you feel alone doesn't mean you are alone. <laughs> and somebody says, well, Linda, what are you here to preach to us about? I'm about to show you. That's my testimony. I'm 16, 17 weeks out of that. Let me tell you something. You don't kiss the face of death without it changing you. It has changed my life. I was brought back. Do you know everybody prayed the same prayer for me? Every one of them. Every one of them prayed the same prayer. You know what the prayer was? I've asked them, would you pray for me? Every one of them said, Father, you can't take him. We need him for the end time revival and you can't take him. He knows what revival is and you can't take him. We've got to have him. Do you know what that means for me? See, you don't understand. I'm still dealing with a physical issue. I had a hernia before this surgery and it is so horrible now that I deal with it every day. That's why I'm wearing sweats and I'm aware of how I'm standing and sitting. I can't stand for very long. It's a torture every single day I live. And I sat in my bedroom the other day and I said, Jesus, I believe you're gonna heal this hernia without surgery. I believe you're going to restore my life because you did not save me from death to deal with this. And I'm telling you that I know revival is on its way because you saved me from death. You brought me back because sons and daughters need fathers. Right now in the Bible, a body of Christ, these young preachers and ministers and worship leaders, they need old coots like me who will stand up and say, son, that's good singing, but there ain't no glory on it because you're gonna to have to get off social media and find the glory of the Lord. And it's not about works, it's about presence, and it's about loving the Lord. Your heart for God is not developed. It's there in seed form, but there's more that God wants to take you into, and you're just happy with a sweet performance. We have had too much good singing that's done nothing. We've had too many good churches that have done nothing. It's time for the kingdom of God to step up and make an impact in this world. It's time for the word of God to be fulfilled that says, and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It does not say the glory, it says knowledge of it. Something's gonna start happening right now in the church. Somebody said, well, the Lord don't need the church. It's going to be in the streets. And nobody's going to ever get credit. That's a lie. Let's get that clear right now, you rebel. 
You don't want God to use the church because you don't want to be a part of a church where a pastor might call you out in your sin. And you want to be some prophet over here. Oh, stop it. If you get outside and you look up and there's no one over you, you're in a dangerous place. Devil going to pick you off. You can call yourself what you want to, but I'll call you what you are. You're a rebel. And you got the spirit of Lucifer, not the glory. There's a mixture in you that needs to be broken. And it ain't coming out just because you got saved. It's coming out when you demand that selfishness of your spirit to be taken to the cross. And you say, Jesus, kill it. Kill it now. And guess what he'll do? He'll undo you. Somebody said, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, I do. Brown's a revival, circa 1995. Preacher's kid, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost in a tent revival in Baltimore, Maryland when I was five years old. I had three black women, black mamas in Jesus. I was knelt in the sawdust of of a tent revival. And I, see, back then we preached the baptism of the Holy Ghost was more than just Shundai. It was the fire. We preached the fire. And you knew when you had it and you knew when you didn't. Devil can speak in tongues. But the power to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, that's what we were after. And that little five-year-old soul of mine said, Lord, I want that. And I remember as a five-year-old going on a fast, going, Lord... Uh, And it wasn't the fast of my choice. Back then, we really fasted. Sorry, Pastor. (laughs) I have a funny story to tell you real quick. Can I tell you a funny story? I'm going to relieve the pressure because I just got strong. Sorry, my filter's gone. Y'all, anybody who knows me, Pastor Don, my my friend, Pastor Don and, and Debbie are here, Metcalf. He's on my board. He pastored a fabulous church in Los Angeles for 37 years. He was the first church I worked at outside of my dad's church. I drove all, this this man of God drove all the way out and helped me move all the way to Los Angeles, California and treated me like a king and was so kind to me. And now he's living here in Tennessee. He moved back and, and turned the church over to somebody wonderful. I'm so honored you're here today. I meant to start with that. But Don knows me pretty well. And I was in that... I was into the fasting thing, still am, but I was into the fasting thing when we were all first getting that revelation to start the beginning of the year with fast, right? So, I mean, I got up there and I said, if you ain't fasting, you ain't saved. We're going to fast. And I did exactly what you did, Brother Cutshaw. I said, basically, if anybody wants to choose what you want to fast, just whatever you need to fast, but make it something you love. Well, I had a pastor's daughter who's, who... Uh, in the church who was blind. Her name is Jana. Her daddy was a district superintendent for the Assemblies of God in Tennessee for years, Brother Jackson. And, and Jana had a great sense of humor. She was funny. She was sitting on the front row with a lady that doesn't go to our church anymore. And she said, well, I tell you, he sure laid it on us today, didn't he? Jana said that. And that woman said, yes. And I'm going to fast. And she said, you are? She said, what are you going to fast? She said, I'm going to fast chocolate cake and vodka. (laughs) Jana could not wait to get to me after the service to tell me. I couldn't wait till the 21 day fast was over to hear the story. And Jana made sure we got the story. She said, I saw her that I got sat next to her again, the end of the fast in three weeks. And I said, well, how did you do on your chocolate cake and vodka fast? She said, well, Jana, I tell you, I did okay. I have two children, I'm a single mother. And she said, the reason I said vodka is because I don't drink a lot. But sometimes when I've had a bad week and my kids are crazy, I'll come in and on Friday evening and have me a vodka and tonic. She said, I want to tell you that I did really good until this Friday. And I'm telling you, my girls were insane and the workplace was terrible. And I have to tell you, I slipped up. 
and I fixed me a vodka and tonic. But I can tell you one thing, the devil is not going to make me eat that chocolate cake. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> that lady's famous and don't know it. Where was I? I was at the Holy Ghost, wasn't I? I got the Holy Ghost when I was five. I remember receiving the Holy Ghost and those mothers were praying me through to the Holy Ghost. And when I received the Holy Ghost, I spoke in tongues, but I cried and I cried all night long till about 4 a.m. the next morning. My mother sat by my bed because we were staying in a hotel room and all night long I cried and prayed in the spirit. And I came to myself about four o'clock in the morning and I saw my mother sitting there and my mother told me that I had prayed all night long. My pillow was wet with my tears. It was the real Holy Ghost. And from that day forward, I would go into trances during the service. My mother played the organ and my dad led singing. And they worked with Roy Sherrill's tent revivalists back in those days. They worked with uh, William Branham, A.A. A. Allen a couple of times. My parents were well known in those hours of, of healing revivals. And I remember the Spirit of God would come on me and I'd grab the tambourine because I had those same black mamas had daughters who taught me how to play a tambourine the right way with a head on it. I could pop that thing, I'd still do it. And I'd get my tambourine at the end of the service and we'd get to praying for people, the Spirit of God would come down and I'd dance. I'd go into a trance and dance before the Lord for two or three hours. Every night. It was not humanly possible. I would have visitations with the Lord. So I know what visitations are. You hear me? We are in an hour right now, and I'm going to try to bring this all together. This is the weirdest thing I've ever done. I've never done my testimony in trying to preach a sermon, but it's not a sermon. The Lord did not call you to just attend services. He did not call you to be an audience. He called you to be a church. And he called you to impact this nation right now. And I'm calling on some people to let you know that that army that I saw is with you. If you have asked God to heal you and you've given up on it, pray one more time. If you've decided to settle that maybe it's not for you and you found yourself trying to comfort yourself with some words, I'm going to be okay. No, don't be okay. Go back to the cross again and say, Jesus, by your stripes, I'm healed. We're in the midst of a, a great change. There's a restless expectation and I've come to realize that we must be fully engaged for the days ahead. But in order to do that, we're going to have to rediscover and re-recognize again, not re-recognize, but recognize again our purpose. You and I have gotten way too happy with mediocrity. You and I have been lulled to sleep by soft, pasty words and preachers with no power and worship with no glory. And we've decided to accept that mediocrity as church. But you were made, and the Lord tonight is calling you to move forward out of your comfort zone. Yes, yes, yes. And get in a place because the brook dried up a long time ago where you are. And there's a false prophetess you got to go deal with. There's a spirit from hell that has been released. And the angels of the Lord, although their swords are drawn, are not going to take off the head of the giant. It's going to take a worshiping boy who knows the glory of the Lord and knows little else to walk out and slay the giant and take his head off. God wants to get the glory through you. Second Kings, I got to give you a scripture to make this legal. 
2 Kings 6, 24. It happened after this that Benadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. Indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. I want you to see the picture. <laughs> Syria has surrounded. Y'all follow me? Surrounded. Oh, Samaria is in trouble. There's no food. We're eating donkey head and dove droppings. And outside the city, it's cut off from all supplies. There's nothing coming in. There's nothing going out. I'm talking to somebody tonight. I'll tell you what the Lord told me in the bathroom just coming out here. He said, tonight I'm going to heal some inward hurts that have paralyzed your effectiveness. That's what he told me. God's here to heal. We're about to see some miracles. We're about to see the power of God. God's about to restore some things to you. I'm not trying to placate you. I'm telling you I've heard from the Lord. You just trust me on this one. The people of Samaria have literally reverted to cannibalism. There's nothing to eat. They're eating each other's children. It's hopeless. The city is offering no help. But now in, the, in chapter 7, verse 3, it says, There are four leprous men at, the, men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why sit we here until the election? <laughs> Wait a minute, it didn't say that, did it? Why sit we here until we die? If we say we're going to enter the city, the famine's in there. We're going to die in there. If, if we sit here, we're going to die. Well, well, how about this? Well, let's just go over to the enemy's camp. Because I got a feeling that the enemy might have the things that belong to us. I got a feeling that the enemy is not starving to death. I got, a, I got an idea. They've got firepower, guns. They've got gunpowder. They've got artillery. They've got gold. They stole it from everybody else. And they've got food. And nobody wants us anyway. See, I don't think you understand what a leper is. A leper could be any of you. A businessman successful with all kinds of money. And one day there's a little spot on his skin and his, honey, his wife says, honey, you need to get that seen about. He goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you need to report this to the priest. They take that leprous man into the priest and the priest would demand that he strip naked and he would inspect his whole body. And when he found leprosy, he didn't get a chance to say goodbye to his wife. He didn't get a chance to say anything about his business dealings. He didn't get to close any stores. He didn't do anything. He was immediately snatched away from his family, his children, his grandchildren, everything he had. And he was put in a leper colony with other people. And the stench of the rotting flesh and the, the parts of their body, ears falling off, noses rotting off, the stench of it. They're eating garbage that's being thrown down a chute so they can have something to eat. The refuse of what other people don't want. You know what I mean? Kind of like staying in the evangelist quarters. All the furniture nobody else wanted in their house. That's what the evangelist got to sleep on. Out there with nothing. And these four leprous men got away from the colony. And they're sitting outside a city in the middle of famine. And they're going death inside the city. Death here. We've got nothing to owe. Oh, the word of the Lord is this. When you decide that you've had enough of what you're going through and you decide to go to the enemy's camp and take back what's yours, the Lord says, I'm moving not until then. We want silver service from the Holy Ghost. We don't want to ever have to go through a surgery. We don't want to ever have a complication or a problem. We, don't want, we just want to pray and believe that God's going to get. Avoid all the pain and the suffering. Let me tell you something. Suffering brings Jesus near. Trust me on that one. 
I hate suffering, but it brings Jesus near. He's nearer when you're suffering than any other time if you can pull yourself out of self-pity long enough to recognize it. Waiting on somebody to come up and say, it's going to be all right, Linda, it's going to be okay. Which is nice for the moment they're saying it. A visit, a card, is all wonderful. But let me tell you, when you start praying in the middle of your suffering, and you say to the Lord, I can't go back. See, we've crossed some lines in America. The church has crossed some lines. I'm not trying to scare you. And I'm talking to you, the people of God today. I'm not talking to preachers. I'm talking to people of God. If you had any idea of the authority in your prayer, if you had any idea of the power that dwells within you, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, if, the, if you had a, any idea of the power of God, you could snatch your children back from their crazy lifestyles and believe them back into the kingdom, you'd have faith to see it instead of feeling like a victim. I've, I've had a son nuts before. There's nothing more debilitating than that. Amber and I, she'd be in her closet rocking back and forth. I'd be in my, clo my closet rocking back and forth. Oh, God, what are you going to do? And one day I, I was at the worst time when my son was just crazy. And I was laying in my bed and I saw a dark image in the corner of my bedroom. And I heard a voice and it wasn't Jesus. And that voice said to me, Oh, you've led worship for millions and you've preached a lot of sermons and you've got a lot of spiritual sons and daughters. But that can't stop me from coming in your home and taking your son. I'm going to kill him. I've got him. You've lost him. At that moment, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead rose up in me. And I grabbed my Bible and I came across that room. I could hardly walk. I came across that room and I said, no, 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 no. You have stepped too far across the line. You messing with my children now. It's one thing for me to suffer in my body for three years, but how dare you think you're going to mess with the inheritance of God? How dare you think you're going to nullify the prayers of my mother and my grandmother and my mother-in-law and my father? How dare you think that your little pipsqueak idea of destruction is going to win? Let me tell you something, Buster. You get your behind and all your little buddies out of my house. And buddy, I opened the door and kicked him out. I'm talking to the people of God. Perry, I'm sorry I'm going this long. I need to hush. Why are we going to sit here till we die? Y'all know this story a long time. But you know what? There's a bunch of y'all sitting in front of the television watching news every day fretting over the president. You're fretting over this. and You're listening to prophets who are prophesying stuff that ain't happening. prophesying political things that ain't moving, nothing's moving, and you go to revival or service and you feel a momentary jolt. Can I tell you what the Lord told me about that momentary jolt when I was 12 years old? You want to hear it? I'm bold tonight. I'm sorry, I'm bold. I was a little boy playing the drums in my daddy's church. I loved Sunday night we had church. Sunday morning we were dead as Baptists. But Sunday night, buddy, we got the Holy Ghost. We get to hucking and bucking and running. And, and you know, remember those services? Do you, anybody y'all remember those? Here's what I miss. I miss when the real Holy Ghost came to the house and, and Sister Smith would get to crying over gossiping over Sister Jones and she'd come across the house and she'd kneel at her feet and say, I want you to forgive me for all the things I've been saying about you. That don't happen in church anymore. Did you notice that? Ain't the real Holy Ghost. The real Holy Ghost convict you of your sins even if you're a believer. You understand that? You won't be able to be in a real Holy Ghost meeting and go home and look at pornography. Holy Ghost will torment the fire out of you. You won't be able to talk and gossip and lie about people and act like you're speaking in tongues. You ain't got the Holy Ghost. That ain't even the Holy Ghost. You just babbling. 
When the real Holy Ghost comes, I mean, he'll convict the people of their sins. That's what he'll do. And I'm telling you, we'd, we'd have them. And I remember as a little boy, man, I wanted it. I wanted it so bad. And I'd be playing the drums, and we'd be singing one of those good old, by and by, when the morning come, when all, I mean, we're just tearing it up. And I, and, and I just say, oh, God, come. If you don't come, if you don't come, I don't want to be here. If you don't come. I mean, I felt like I was trying to work up the Holy Ghost. I wasn't working up the people. I was like, come on, Lord. And I remember a 12-year-old boy baptized in the Holy Ghost when he was five had trances and times with the Lord that I could not explain to you to this day. Somebody says, well, you were used in revival. Let me tell you something. It was all a result of all those days. And I literally would play those drums and I'd say, come. And one night the Holy Spirit spoke to me at 12. He said, watch the people. And I said, why? He said, I'm about to send a wave of glory. I'm 12 now. I don't even understand half of this. He said, watch the people. Don't participate, just watch. And buddy, I watched it. It started over here and it went all the way across. And I mean, the glory of the Lord came. People were falling on the floor. Sinners were running and getting saved. People were hucking and bucking and shouting and running. And I mean, it was wild. It was like, wow. He said, keep watching. After a few minutes, the wave was over. And it's just like somebody turned something off. The people just totally went right back to where they were. They were finished. They had had their fix. I'm 12. I'm 12, Brian. I'm 12. I don't even understand what I'm asking. I say, Lord, what are you showing me? He says, that wave was not sent for them. He said, I don't send my glory for the primary purpose of touching the people. I send my glory to bring them in closer to touch me. When are you going to quit going to good services so you can feel a little better? And when are you going to say, well, wait a minute, I can't go back to where I was. There's nothing there. And I can't go in the city. They're going to kill me if I go in there. I think I've just got to get closer to God. I think I've just got to get in. I've got to push in. I've got to stop this foolishness. There is more. You don't understand the power of God. You don't under. Oh, friends, please. I didn't even understand the heavenly host till I saw them. And then I heard the voice of Jesus broken, going, I want my bride. I want my bride to only have eyes for me. Why are they so distracted? Life is a few days and full of trouble. It has nothing to do with your present situation. There's a greater glory. And I'm just going to tell you right now, you've been feeling it brewing in you for two years. It's bubbling up in you, this holy dissatisfaction. You go to service after service and you go back home and you go, I want more than that. It was good, but there's got to be more. There's got to be more. When we start seeking more, that's when more is found. When we are happy sitting at the gate where people are starving to death and we are happy to be okay and alive, we're never going to go where the enemy has taken things from us. My Lord, he's taken our faith. He's taken our children. He's taken our nation. And it's not some great preacher who's going to bring it all back. It's you going on, hold on a second. I got a prayer closet. Now let me tell you about when you pray. It was the prayers of the saints that saved my life. Am I going too long? I don't mean to. Thank you. You and I will be here, won't we, brother? Chapter 7, verse 5, and they rose at twilight to go to the camp of Syrians. Y'all know this passage. And when they came to the outskirts of, uh, outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, to their surprise, to their surprise, to their surprise, they thought they were going to die. To their, to their surprise. Oh, my, 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 my. 
When I came back from the Ukraine and we were in the middle of Brown's Rural Revival, we had gone three nights, I was totally surprised. I thought, this is just another dead Assembly of God church. Guess what? It wasn't. To my surprise, we were in revival. To their surprise, no one was there for the Lord. The Lord. Who? Who did it? The Lord. Who? Oh, somebody work with me. I'm going to preach all night. Who? Shout to the Lord. Come on. Who did it? The Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of the heavenly host, the great army. And they said, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us because four leprous outcasts my, 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 had decided I can't do this anymore. Let me draw a thread for you and I'll be finished. I've got more notes. If you want to know if I can actually preach, tune into Grace Church. I actually do preach. Three points and a poem and all that stuff. There's a pastor in Pensacola named John Kilpatrick about a year and a half before revival started. Was in his rose garden out back of his house. I know John looks tough and mean, but he loves flowers and trees. <laughs> He's good with some things. Trees trimming, don't call him. <laughs> Do you remember when we went over to his house? He had this little, this beautiful tree that was in the middle of this. You walked around it in the front of his house and it was gone. And I said, John, what happened to the tree? And Brenda, his wife, said, oh, Lord, Lindell. He got out there cutting on it, and he got one side wrong and the other side wrong. Finally, he got mad and just cut the whole thing down. <laughs> John is seeing after his roses. And he said he was looking at a rose, and he heard the voice of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord said, John, Can I use your church? And John said, yes, Lord. He said, let me clarify to you. I'm not going to use you. I want your church. I'm going to send another man. You're not going to be the preacher. Can I have your church? John had just built a few years before a beautiful sanctuary. And he realized that buildings don't satisfy. And he realized that all oh, whatever you accomplish doesn't make you happy. And he threw the keys on the altar in 1991 and said, Lord, if this is all there is, I don't want it. And the Lord comes a few years later and says, John, can I have your church? And John said the right answer. Lord, can I have a seat? Can I just have a seat? A year and a half later, to our surprise, I feel the Lord here. I feel the glory here is what I feel. Do you feel that? I feel the glory of the Lord here. Whew. I'm telling you, saints, there's more for you than against you. I'm telling you, whatever's been holding you back, please get rid of it. There's no time. Behold, he comes quickly. His reward is with him. You, you get rid of all of it. This is not about heaven or hell. This is about an end time move of God that you must be a part of. That's what this is about. This is about the harvest. This is about the prayers of the saints from the beginning of the church, line upon line, precept upon precept. This is not just about what you desire. This is the desire of the lamb for the reward of his suffering. This is what we're talking about here. You think you want your grandbabies to be saved? He wants them saved worse. 
Well, I can't do anything. Oh, I beg to differ. Grandma has some power. If she can get her focus off of herself for five minutes and go, wait just a second, my grandson will not die and go to hell. He will come out of that lifestyle and he'll clean up. It's going to change. I declare it in the name of the Lord. All these young ministers, you just want a full itinerary? Get you nothing. Little notoriety if you get on the right television show. Who cares? At the end of it, you're the same dumb person you always were. <laughs> you may have an entourage to carry your bag for you in a special parking place, you're the same dummy you ever were. It don't make you happy. But the glory of the Lord that's rising in this room right now that brought me back from death that's going to heal some of you in this room tonight if you'll stop settling and believe again God's going to do some stuff here's, the, here's, your, here's your deal and I close with this I got to quit I want to worship a little bit I feel him here Here's your deal. Is he going to use you or somebody else? Because if you're not willing, he's not stopping because of you. His agenda is eternal. You see, we don't serve the Lord out of duty. We serve the Lord because we get to. We are fortunate to be called. The people of God. Those of us in ministry are blessed beyond measure. We truly deserve to dig ditches. We should be digging ditches in prison garb is what we really should be if the truth of our hearts were revealed. But God has reached way down and lifted us out of despair and placed a heavenly call in our life. And let me tell you something. It is so much fun. And if you're focusing on the battle that's raging against you, you're playing into the enemy's hand. Because now your focus is on the battle. Not the Lord God's Sabaoth. You know what that means? Great Avenger. Lord God's Sabaoth. You don't understand that. I'm telling you, every person who's ever been oppressed, every person who's ever been lied about, every person that's been raked through the coals, every tribe, every people who have been despised, every church that had rotten tomatoes thrown at them back in the Pentecostal days where they didn't understand why they were rejected, but we learned how to press through the rejection to the power of the Holy Ghost. Every one of those, the Lord God Sabaoth, is waiting to avenge if you'll move out of the way and let him do it for you. As long as you got the sword in your, in your hand, you don't need God's army. Take the sword out of your hand. The heavenly host is on its way. How many got somebody in your family need to be saved? How many got a physical ailment needs to be healed? Stand up right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, I'm not real religious. Is that okay? I spent years learning religion and about five years of revival learning how to not be religious anymore. I found out that you don't need spooky music for the glory to come. I found out you don't really need anything but a hungry heart. Oh, my, 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 my. He's here. Oh, he's here. <laughs> he's here. In the name of Jesus. Paul and Silas saw the lame man by the gate. And they said, such as I have, I give. Come on, Tony. Let me tell you what I've got. I've got a miracle. I shouldn't be here today. I should not be alive. But because I am, 
I'm going to give you what I have. And that's a miracle. Because I need another miracle, but I'm not getting it till I give this one away. That's how it works in the kingdom. Brother Cutshaw was talking about giving, and he's talking about the principle of the kingdom. If you give, there's always something to give. But it's not just money. Whatever you have, give it. So from the left side of this auditorium tonight to the right, Lord, you see these people standing here. And Lord, we don't have to work ourselves up into a frenzy to convince you to come and do what the cross did. We don't need to work ourselves up to emotional excitement to make anything happen. Because I can promise you, Father, when you healed me in Vanderbilt Hospital, there was no music going on and there was no preacher yelling in a microphone. But the angels of the Lord brought healing virtue from heaven. Father, release the angels of the Lord. You said you would give your angels charge over your people. Lord, release the angels of God with healing virtue right now. Diabetes, you got to go. I don't care if grandma had it, great grandma had it. Heart disease, go in Jesus' name. We speak right now life over you. You will live and you will not die. We speak right now to hypertension, every issue, every bit of it. We speak healing in Jesus' name. <laughs> because we're not going to sit here until we die anymore. We're not going to sit here until we get a good doctor's report. Because, Lord, we believe the report of the Lord. And God, it's not just a Pentecostal thing. It's a kingdom thing. God, you are the healer of all of our diseases. You are the restorer of our physical ailments. God, the army of the Lord is encompassed about us tonight. And God, they are wondering why we won't believe you. But Lord, we're reaching out with whatever faith we have. And we're saying, God, we believe. We believe you were born of a virgin. We believe you're coming back again. And guess what else we believe? You're the healer of all of our diseases. We believe that our children who have been dedicated to you are returning back home. We believe all of that. We believe there's a great outpouring of your spirit about to touch the nations of the world. And your glory is going to be known all over the world. Even those who refuse to believe it are going to see it with their eyes. And they'll reject it because their hearts are hard. But those who love you are going to hear of the glory. And prodigals are coming home. Sons and daughters are going to shake themselves out of vomit. And they're going to shake themselves out of death and sleep. And they're coming back to your house. And God, you're about to reverse the attack against the ministry. You're about to reverse the attack against the en enemy that he has unleashed to discourage your pastors and your prophets and your evangelists and your apostles that tried to cause them not only to stumble but to lose heart and to ask why. And I'm telling you, Lord, right now your spirit is being released. I know it is. And I, there's a reversal. There's a reversal. There's a reversal. There's, ooh. Okay, I'm going to prophesy. I don't do this all the time, but I do it when I hear it. The Lord says in ministries, I'm about to reverse the hurts. I'm about to reverse the hurts. The enemy came to attack you, to destroy you, but, and he hurt you but I'm going to reverse the hurts. I'm going to cause healing to flow out of your ministry on a level that you were hurt. The depth of despair that you felt will be the depth of joy that you expel. Out of your belly will flow liver, rivers of living water. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And the Lord says, I'm about to change the face of the church completely. And I'm turning the church into a place of hunger and ravenous seeking after my face. And the Lord says, don't take fear or don't worry about those who fall away. Because the Lord says they were never mine anyway. Don't worry about them. 
Go after them and try to bring them back, but they will refuse because they never were mine. They never bought in. They never bought in. I brought them to repentance multiple times. I dealt with them multiple times, and they turned a hard heart toward me, says the Lord, and they're not coming back. But the Lord says, in their place, I'm waking up every age and ethnicity. I'm waking up an army of believers. They're going to come out of the woodwork and they're going to carry the end time glory and they're going to carry this presence and they're going to have no other God but me and they're going to have nothing but my glory and they're not going to have superficial revival. They're going to seek a move of my spirit. And the Lord says, when you seek me with all my, all your heart, that's when you'll find me. And these are going to find me. And I'm going to answer their prayer. And I'm going to shake regions with a move of my spirit. Regions. There will be regions where my glory is being poured out. There will be regions where death is everywhere. There will be regions where spiritual apathy reign supreme and right next door will be the power of my glory being poured out because the Lord says I know who is mine and I know who I have predestined to call into my kingdom and the Lord says I will call them all and I will have what I suffered for they shall be mine says the Lord they shall be mine says the Lord they will walk in my ways and don't count them out because don't give up prayer for them they shall be mine they will be on fire and they will be at my altar because I have predestined them to know me. They'll come out from the darkness. But the Lord says, I'm looking this evening for those who will once again believe me. Whew. Believe me again. Watch what I'll do. Shake off grave clothes. Shake off apathy. And come after me again. The times and seasons of the Lord are upon you. The times and seasons of the Lord are upon you. Oh, my, 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 Oh, my, 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 my. A greater glory of the Lord is on its way. I'm telling you, a greater glory is on its way. He's looking for his bride. Hola, ma shataba hasata. Come on, everybody, lift up your voice and praise him right now. Come on, everybody. Everybody who's felt alone. Everybody who's felt abandoned. Everybody who's felt like nobody cared about them. Come on, lift up your voice. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift up your voice. If the Lord is talking to you about healing, come on, lift up your voice. God's going to heal you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. a song for the bridegroom This is a song for 
the Lord. Your bride is anxiously awaiting. We've had all this earth and all this world that we can possibly afford. But what we need is you. More and more of you, more of your glory, more of your power, more of your spirit, Lord. Because there are heights we have never climbed. Take us up higher, higher. There are depths we have never known. Take us deeper, deeper. We're hungry, Lord. We're hungry for you, Jesus. We're hungry for you. We won't be satisfied with anything. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste. Oh, taste. This is a song from the Spirit. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. 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 Come quickly, Lord. Come quickly, Lord. Jesus, come and catch your church away. Come and rescue us. Oh, come quickly, Lord. Come quickly, Lord. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Spirit and the Bride. Turn us into your bride, Lord. We're glad to be your church, but we want more. We want to be your bride. Lord, we remove all other lovers and we cast them away right now. The idols of technology that we've worshiped and we've pacified ourselves with it for hours leave us cold. The idols we have bowed to of ministry have done nothing for us. God, we want to be your bride. We only want to move when you say move. We only want to speak when you say speak. We're desperate, we're desperate, we're desperate, we're desperate. Remove the hardness of our heart. Take away our stony heart and give us a heart of brokenness before you, Lord. We're hungry for you, Lord. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come and restore us. Heal us. Deliver us. Set us free. Come and fill us with your power. Feel us with your glory. Saturate our lives. Oh, send your power. Send your glory. Come, Lord. 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 Lord is my 
shepherd He goes before me <laughs> He's here Defender behind Woo. I won't fear No, 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 no I'm filled with anointing My cup's overflow No weapon can harm me Oh, it's true, it's true I won't fear Hallelujah. Come on, saints. Hallelujah. You ain't singing. I want you to sing this right now to those spirits of depression that have been tormenting you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. He is my comfort. Always holds me close. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am not. is here. I know we got to go, but my Lord, somebody worship with me. Hallelujah. The Holy One of Israel is rising up strong on my behalf. He is my comfort. Obey the Lord. I was told to obey the Lord. Musicians, please take this as humbly as I mean it. I am a musician. You can sit behind those instruments and never be phased. I've did it for years. But if you're going to be used in the days to come, ain't got nothing to do with who you know. Because when God needed David to play the demons off the king, he knew how to get David in front of the king. God is not interested in your talent at all. Matter of fact, your talent is the greatest hindrance to the glory in your life because you know how. The Lord wants to bring his minstrels. See, you're not a prop. I don't know if there's a preacher who's treated you like a prop. You're not a prop to make it easier for us to minister. No, you're not. You're forerunners. And the enemy has lied to you. <laughs> and think, well, I'll just go for a gig and get paid. God is looking for players. There's nothing wrong with getting paid. I'm fine with that. I'm not preaching against that. But I'm asking you this question. Are you for sale? If you are, you're not useful. Preachers, if you're for sale, you're not useful. Because he doesn't need guys with a good paycheck. He needs people who will run into hell with their pants soaked with kerosene. Kudaba shandaba. I feel God's glory in this place. I'm not working this up. Don knows I don't work anything up. Matter of fact, Don, the Lord is not done with you, and I don't even know what he's going to do, but there's a door coming that's going to open. It's going to shock you. All hands on deck. Can I tell you a revelation of the Lord?
Straight is the way it narrows the gate, and few there will be that find it. Is that what the word says? Broad is the way. Now let me help you out. You're the few. It doesn't matter if you're a baker, a candlestick maker. It doesn't matter if you serve. It doesn't matter what you do. You may not see, but you're the few. There's just a few coming through. And guess what happens? It's this few that's going to bring in the move of God, that's going to bring the harvest in. It's not what's happening up here. It's part of this. This is all part of it. The minstrels going before with the glory of the Lord, not for sale, not settling. And the preachers preaching the word. It's all of it. But we've glorified this too many years. You are the, oh, you're the few. And you've got to get healed. You need your emotions to be healed. And the Lord is here to heal your emotions today. Yes, you got hurt, but it's over. You're healed. Yes, you're going through hell. Your kids are crazy. They will wake up, but they're not going to wake up while you focus on them. They're going to wake up when you go. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, if you want to go ahead and be idiots, go be idiots. But let me tell you, when you come back to this house, you're going to find a house full of prayer. You're going to find the glory of the Lord. The angels ascending and descending on this house. You're going to feel the glory of God. You ain't going to be sitting here on Facebook all day long. We're going to be entertaining the angels unaware. That's what we're doing at this house. My children shall be saved and walk in the ways of the Lord. My body will line up with what I'm called to do. I will not die until God says I do. And when I do, it's a promotion. Because the Lord is my shepherd. Everything is father filled and he goes before me. Before I ever got to the hospital that day, the Lord had already been there. Before I ever got in the ambulance and my wife didn't know where I was, the Lord was already there. He goes before me. And for those people that are so chicken livered that they can't tell you to your face, but they send in agents and informants to try to tear you down. Let me tell you what I got behind me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. Fear not him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both flesh and body and soul in hell. Because death ain't no big deal. I just kissed it. I just kissed it. And you know what I found out? Death came up to the desk of the Heavenly Father and put my expiration paper waiting for him to stamp it. And the Father said, no, there's another revival coming. I'm going to need some Perry Stones, Brian Cutshaw, Lyndall Cooley, John Kilpatrick. They're going to have to father this thing because these crazy kids will go off the rails. We're going to have to have somebody going, y'all are off on here. See, revelation comes by the Spirit of God, but if you don't have wisdom and knowledge and you don't have a walking index of scripture, you can get into some crazy doctrine. William Brandon, my mother and dad sang in his meetings. He got so far off. He got so far off. He denied the Godhead. Could he do miracles, signs and wonders? You better believe it. He could heal the sick. I mean, powerful miracles that God brought in that man's life. He died a heretic. <laughs> Gotta have fathers. What does the word say? There'll be many teachers, not many fathers. You know what that tells me, Perry? God saved this old goat up here. Because there's a few going. 
and I got to get a stick on their behinds. All right, son, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, go. No, that's, that's sweet and wonderful, but that ain't the word. Get back in the word. Come on, let's go. You get, you, these musicians, I, I qualified to tell you all the truth, right? Surely. Y'all quit entertaining because for a paycheck. Let's get, let's get in here in the glory. I'm going to prophesy again. I'm telling you. The Lord says this is the hour that has been spoken about for the last 60 years. That I would raise up minstrels. I would raise up psalmists that would begin to hear of the roller decks and the it, literally the songs from heaven are about to come into the earth and the lord says you thought those other songs were from me but the lord said that was a conglomerate of writers what i'm about to do is going to come from people who shouldn't be able to write a song at all but they're dedicated to me and the glory is going to come on them and i'm just going to download it and it's songs to get the bride home oh my my we're about to write songs that are going to get the bride home oh my lord we're almost there, friends. We got to get the bride home. We got to get the bride home. I got to shut up. How many believe the Lord healed you tonight? Look over at your neighbor and say, I got healed tonight. How many have a sickness or an ailment or whatever that you can put your hands on? You know it's there, right? You know, how many, how many have it? How many have it? Okay, when you go home tonight, if you still see that thing, whatever it is, you put your hand on it and you say, I give you praise, Jesus. I give you praise. This doesn't belong in my body. I give you praise. You're the healer of all of my diseases. Is this okay? I'm sorry to go so long. I have had no lunch. My wife won't feed me. She literally, and Tony drove over all the way over here. We haven't sang very many songs. We'll sing one more. I'm wanting food, and this is Church God Town. Surely there's something open late. But I lost 30 pounds. And uh, it worked out good for me to wear sweats because it's a cool thing to do now. But y'all wait till I, I, I get the manifestation of the total healing that, that's coming my way. Because I already, who would I have a shot? Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into auditoriums with a keyboard and nothing else and about two or 3,000 intercessors. And we're going to go crazy. And we're not going to worry about the time. We're going to write songs on the fly. We're going to hear from heaven. And we're going to open up the heavens over cities. That's what we're going to do. See, we're going to Swiss cheese the principalities. We're going to Swiss cheese it. And then the Lord's going to let some young man, maybe like Nick, if he can just keep it together, hit the final detonator. Somebody's going to hit that detonator and all that stuff's coming down. Oh, maybe my job may not be. I don't care. I don't need to. I just want to see the glory. I feel God here. Ah. Don't feel no waste time. You know that? I've come too far from where I started from. Six minor. Nobody told me that the way would be easy, but I don't believe. He brought me this far to leave me. What key we in? What key we in? That's a terrible key. Ah. Oh, Lord. Can we do this? Y'all are kind of white to be able to do this, but it's okay. The Lord loves honkies too. I don't no waste time I come too far from where I started from Nobody told me that the road would be easy But I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me Let's take it out 
up in a gospel key, like G. Breaking off behind me, I got a feeling everything gonna be all right. Now I know y'all are Pentecostal around here, and most of y'all look, y'all don't participate. That's how. What's different now, see, is when we do this years ago, even Grandma with her dentures would be out there. Y'all have learned into turned into a bunch of lookers. Oh, we'll just let all the people get that out. But let me tell you something. When I was dancing as a little boy, I was pouncing on the devil's head. And I was prophesying with my feet. You see, there's hopping that the, the, Pente the Charismatics brought in. There's dancing in the spirit that the Pentecostals used to do. But that's all gone too. Because we made so much fun of it that nobody will do it anymore. But there is a dance in the spirit, just like there's a praise in the spirit, just like there's a song in the spirit, just like, the, oh my goodness, there's a dance that's got something on it. And it ain't just about emotion. It's about God's about to do something because it's that dance that David danced before the Lord when he brought the glory back. Oh my, my, I feel the glory coming back. I say we just go out of here on a high note, don't you? Say with me, say, I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm free, my mind is free, my children are free, my life is good, God's got everything, it's all Father filtered, nothing can touch me without His permission, oh yeah, all right. It's time to have a praise break. Let's go. Mm -hmm. I've got a feeling everything gonna be all right. Oh. Oh 
y'all still ain't moving enough for me. Look, if I'm up here dancing with what I'm dealing with, I ain't putting up with it out of you. If you can't dance, that's okay, but just... And I want you to sing it loud and declare it to the heavens. The kingdom of heaven is all right. All right. All right.
victory is yours tonight. Hallelujah. The victory is yours tonight. Just claim it in Jesus' name. Claim it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Declare it. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. I declare victory in Jesus' name. I declare victory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Oh, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. When we and me and you and Faith and Pam used to sing in revivals, yeah. Faith, you need to get up here. This girl can sing. I said the word of God done told me everything gonna be all right. I said the word of God done told me everything I'm gonna be all right. Oh, yeah. I tell you this, one day you know my my daddy told me everything's son gonna be all right. My favorite part you know the holy ghost he done told me already everything is gonna be all yeah yes it will yes it will I want to tell you, hell fears what you just did in this place tonight. It terrorizes every demon that has been assigned against you. And you have just unleashed angels at your address. The angels of the Lord encamp round about those who fear him and deliver them. If you did not get your breakthrough, it is coming in Jesus' name. You look for it. You get up in the morning and you dance another dance. And the next day you dance another dance. And I'm telling you, victory is yours, declares the Lord. Victory is yours. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. You know what, I, I'm going to do something that I've never done here before. And as a matter of fact, I don't know that I've ever done it, but one or two times in my life. But uh -oh. the Holy Spirit told me to do this when you and Amber were up testifying. And, and, and this is so out of character for me. And those of you who know me and know the way I operate, it's very out of character for me. But I, I'm going to ask you to come one more time and sow into this man of God's ministry. I know we've taken up our offering, and this is not about giving, but what the Holy Spirit told me is that he's getting ready to unleash something in Lyndall and Amber Cooley's life, and that we need to have a seed in that harvest of that future. Whatever that means, I want you to bring the screens back up, Jonathan, because some of you may can only give on your phone, but we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna give whatever comes in, every single dime, it doesn't matter, whatever comes in in the next few 
moments, we're going to give to them. And this is different, I understand, from the way I operate. But this is something I know the Holy Spirit has told me to do. So if you want to give tonight, just come and lay it on one of these on one of these speakers here, these big black speakers. Let's sing it again, guys. Or sing something again. And if you need to give online, give this way. But if you want to come and give, just lay it on one of these speakers. Here we go. They're, they're going ahead and giving us the buckets. I just want you to obey God because I don't want you to miss a blessing. I don't want you to miss something that God's getting ready to do in you and God's getting ready to do in them. I just want to walk in obedience. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. 